In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for giving us another wonderful and a beautiful day. Thank you, Father, for the privilege that you give us to gather together as one family. Though we are in different parts, different time zones, different assignments that we have, Probably some of us beginning the day, some of us almost ending the day, some of us in the middle of the day. Yet, Lord, you have given us that hunger. You have given us that thirst to come and hear your voice, to hear your holy word. Today, Lord, as you teach us the word, as you help us to understand the responsibility that we have as the body of Christ, the responsibility that we have as believers in order to ensure discipline in the body of Christ, to make a difference in our lifetime to truly magnify and bless your name we ask you spirit of god at this moment to come into this class and teach us the word as you are the best teacher make this teaching for us simple make it easy make it practical for us help us to understand how we can put this discipline in our everyday life especially in relationship to believers in relationship to our own family, in relationship in our community, in relationship with our overall parishes and our own larger church. Help us, Lord, to ensure that this love that you have put into our heart, this, this discipline that you have put into our hearts, we can, we can bring it to pass. We can bring it into the lives of those whom we are meeting so that, Lord, we together can be that instrument in order to save that soul, in order to bring that person into a relationship, into that intimacy with Jesus. Today, as you teach, as I, as I share the word, Spirit of God, take complete control of all my faculties, my heart, my mind, my lips, my tongue, my vocal cords. Nothing of me, everything of you. And Lord, together as one family, as we hear your voice, help us, Lord, to put this word into practice and not only live victoriously, but bring so many souls to live victoriously in the kingdom of God. We thank you and we praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So my brothers and sisters, a warm welcome to each one of you. You know, for the last two days, we have been studying about church discipline. And you know, one of the things about church discipline, as I mentioned to you at the beginning of this class, is it is not a very popular topic. It's not something that you anyone wants to teach about because most of the time when it comes to church discipline, it is a very tough decision to make for the church, but a faithful church, a church who cares for its members, who cares for the eternal destiny of its members will be serious on this matter and you know, will we'll, we'll sort of take the necessary appropriate steps or will move into action to ensure that discipline is done. You know, my brothers and sisters, the word discipline, as, as the word suggests, you know, when we have, we have been in school, we have also been, you know, in, at our workplaces, we have been in different, different organizations. And if you see in the secular world, even for that matter, if you are driving the car, if you are driving the car at 80 miles an hour in a, in a, in a 60 mile zone, Surely the cameras are going to catch you. Surely the cameras are going to give you a ticket. If you overspeed, surely the authorities are going to come to you and give you a fine. For what reason? Because you got money, extra money to pay that fine to discipline you so that you will learn not to break that, that rule, not to break that uh, speed limit so that you will now be able to respect and honor that speed limit. If this is also possible in a secular world, my brothers and sisters, church discipline is something that is so very important because it is not talking about, you know, paying a few dollars fine or a few rupees fine or a few pounds fine. This is talking about our eternal destiny. And you know, my brothers and sisters, when a church, when a, when a real true church of God is, is, is very serious about the eternal destiny of its members. Because at the, end of the, at the end of the day, after we have lived this life on earth, there is an eternity out there. And if we have never disciplined ourselves, if we have never learned how 
the we don't appreciate the cost that was paid to set us free we don't appreciate the discipline that god wants us in our in our relationship with him then brothers and sisters we will simply not be able to be there one day because we have ignored the corrections of the lord we have ignored what the lord has really been wanting to tell us and you know my brothers and sisters the lord is not going to come to the earth and speak to us like as i'm speaking to you in an audible voice he has given us his living word he has planted his spirit into our hearts and therefore we have the written word of god we have the spirit of god within us we as we study the word of god that word is planted abiding in us and now the spirit and the word that is planted in us will help us to be disciplined and allow us to progress on our journey of faith so that we can one day be welcomed by the father when jesus comes again the second time you know my brothers and sisters having spoken to you about our eternal destiny spoken to you about the the, the 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 you know what we need to do on this earth many people will ask today why the church is not taking steps of disciplining its members i don't know many of you would have this question in your mind why is the church not taking steps to discipline its members so you know we we go to church there are so many people we meet there we fellowship with people we go to the same play, prayer service the word of god that is uh, preached is is preached to everybody but the response that you get is not from the whole congregation the same some people are serving in the church some people are serving their community and some people are just like sunday christians or they are just like you know who will do their job they will do their worship they will go home because they are doing just the bare minimum but isn't it the same father who's giving us the instruction isn't it the same father who's speaking to us through his word so brothers and sisters why does the church in most cases allow serious damage to be done and then only act as a face saving or as you know as something as a last resort in order in the area of discipline i don't know if you have heard this but in the church today you will find there is so much things that need to be put in order there are so much of discipline that needs to be enforced and many a times we begin to say why is discipline not being enforced why don't we see what we have learned in the last two days being actually carried out and why only when things get very serious it's out in the newspaper pagans start talking the 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 ungodly start talking about all the all the things that are happening inside the church then only some decision is made and why is discipline taken as the last resort you know my brothers and sisters sometimes we use the word in the church call excommunication we talk about somebody being stripped of their authority and why are these terms even being used when we have a properly uh, laid down system in scriptures you know i don't know whether you have heard these terms excommunication or you have heard of things called stripped of the authority somebody has been stripped of the authority you we read all these terms and and sometimes you begin to wonder why should we reach that state of excommunication or why should somebody be stripped of the authority when you have a very very clear laid system by scriptures which is giving you a step by step procedure by which you should not reach that stage because if you are talking about excommunication you are talking about stripping somebody of authority then scriptures don't use those terms they simply say if that person has never even you know obeyed the church it, we have seen yesterday whenever there is a dispute it should be one to one secondly one to one doesn't work then you take the uh, presence of two to three witnesses if that doesn't work then you tell the whole church and even if the person doesn't listen to the church then that person is treated like a pagan he is treated like an unbeliever so there is no question of excommunication or there is no such thing as being stripped of the authority that person is a pagan he doesn't want to listen to the church he doesn't want to accept authority so the question is that person was never a believer in the first place and you know my brothers and sisters coming to such a situation in our life you know when we talk about these things about excommunication uh, stripping somebody of authority you find these things happening as a last resort and the only reason we see that these things are happening is because we as the church love ourselves more than we love god 
just think about it what i'm saying if we are not in a position to discipline somebody in a step by step manner before it is too late it only means we as the church are equally responsible because we love ourselves more than we love god now this can be a very very you know hurting statement it can be something that can even poke and point our hearts and we'll be saying are you are we to be blamed for all these things that are happening we are not involved we are not in authority we are not in you know we are not the people who have to take the decision but you know my brothers and sisters when we understand that this discipline is a must to protect the church listen i mean i say it is it is a must to protect the church i'm not talking about the church building i'm not talking about the color of the walls i'm not talking about the roof of the church of church building i'm not talking whether the acs are working or the fans are working or whether the lights are working or the sound system is working i'm not talking about that i'm talking about the members of that church you know my brothers and sisters we must understand that we are dealing with the eternity of people here and you know if we understand that you know people need to be taught the truth people need to be disciplined to understand that if they don't change if they don't repent if they don't come to the lord and they don't accept the authority of the church which is really a true church of god which is founded on the teachings of the apostle which is founded and rooted in the word of god then we are not going to even leave a legacy for future generations please understand my brothers and sisters there are two things involved here as far as church discipline is concerned one is the eternal destiny of the members that attend that church at that particular time or in that particular generation secondly we are also going to leave a legacy for the generations to come imagine there is so much of material so much of word being preached today when we have the 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 the, the internet we have so much of storage of material we have books that are written so many things that are there if people can understand that we have to understand that we have reached this particular stage of our in our in our faith walk because of so many people who have carried the the faith who have, who have passed on the faith to us and you know my brothers and sisters there are future generations that will come and if those future generations do not see the word of god being preached they don't see people living with the word of god they don't see people who are living their faith every day of their life there are people who live like pagans on the street what is going to happen to our future generation just think about it jesus before he could come onto this earth the lord the heavenly father was sending prophets for almost 7 800 years you know if you talk about the prophet isaiah you talk about the prophet jeremiah you talk about all these prophets who are prophesying the coming of the messiah there was a time in which the lord was preparing all those generations right from the time of abraham david all along so that that seed could be protected and somebody would be available to say yes i would let my womb be used in order for the son of man to come and you know brothers and sisters if god took so many years before his son jesus could come into this world then in the same way before jesus comes again the second time he wants this light of faith to be passed on to the generation because jesus says when the son of man comes that's what jesus himself said when the son of man comes again will he find any faith on earth that's what that's what jesus is saying when the son of man returns the second time will he find any faith on earth and you know my brothers and sisters what we are witnessing today without the word of god we are just witnessing religion we are witnessing rituals we are just traditions customs we are actually going back to the law we are just doing something we are just doing our obligation but we have failed to understood that we really need to have that intimacy we really need to have that relationship with the lord we really need to get to the word of god we need to build up our faith so that we not only are going to make an impact in our generation but we are also going to make an impact in the generations to come and you know my brothers and sisters what has happened today is rather would you know what we would want to receive is praises we want to receive approval from one another we are not ready to you know speak out our faith we are not ready to admonish people we are not ready to discipline people why because we want the praises we want the approval of one another instead of getting the approval of god 
And you know, Jesus, when he walked on this earth, Jesus cautioned the people of his own generation. He said, you all want the praises of one another. You all want the, you know, the, the approval of one another. But what about the approval that comes from God? How many of us would rather prefer to be approved by God than be approved by one another and please one another? I want to take you to the book of John, the gospel of John, John chapter 12, verses 42 to 43. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess it for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue for they loved human glory more than the glory that comes from God. So in John chapter 12 verses 42 to 43, we read that even the authorities, some of the authorities during the time of Jesus, they believed in Jesus. Even the authorities believed in Jesus, but the Pharisees did not confess it because some of the Pharisees, they feared that some of the Pharisees and the scribes would throw the people out of the synagogue. They refused to believe in Jesus. And what did Jesus say? For they loved human glory more than the glory that comes from God. You know, my brothers and sisters, if we are really not ready to speak our faith because somebody will say, what are you talking? If somebody is going to say, what is that nonsense you are talking? If somebody says, this is what we have received. How are you talking about those things? You know, my brothers and sisters, the word of God, the spirit of God will always confirm the truth of God's word and the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit and the word are one. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 6 verse 63. He says, my word is spirit, my word is life. So the word and the Holy Spirit are one. And therefore, whenever we speak the word of God, whenever we speak the, 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 the promises of God, we are actually speaking what the Holy Spirit is asking us to speak. And you know, my brothers and sisters, Jesus is saying, the, the verse of uh, chapter 12, verses 43 is saying, the people at the time of Jesus, they loved human glory more than the glory that came from God. And you know, my brothers and sisters, this is the principal reason that the church does not discipline its members. Why? It is all a matter of who has the clout, who has the money, who has the position, who has the power. We are actually encouraging sin in the church because public opinion matters more than God's law. And that is why many people today are perishing. You know, my brothers and sisters, please understand. It is your eternity that is at stake. Tomorrow, when we are standing before God, we cannot tell the Lord, Lord, it was that pastor who taught me the, you know, he taught me all nonsense. It was that priest who taught me all nonsense. It was that teacher who came in my life who taught me all the nonsense. Lord, it was my husband who came in my life who was a problem. It was my wife who came into my life was a problem. You know, my brothers and sisters, when we stand before the Lord, we will have to answer only for ourselves. There will be no pointing of fingers because every single person will have to answer that, uh, that, that, that question themselves. And therefore, if you and I today have been given the written word of God, if we have been given the word of God. Now, this, my brothers and sisters, if the word of God has been given to us, if the word of God has been given to us. Now, it is a choice for us whether we want to open this book and ask the Holy Spirit to teach us or we just want to keep this word of God or this book on the shelf and just find some ready-made meal. You know, there is a difference between a ready-made meal and there is a difference between preparing a meal. What is the diff what, what is the, what am I trying to say? You know, if you go to a restaurant, you don't need to go and buy the vegetables or buy the meat or buy the fish and go through the hassle of cooking, marinating it, putting it in the oven or cooking it and going through the process. It's all ready made. All that you do is you pay the money and you go and buy the food and you can eat it. But when a person comes home with all the raw material, they bring in the fish, they bring in the meat, they bring in the vegetables, they have to go and cut the onions, they have to light the fire, they have to go and marinate the food, they have to cook the food and now they have to serve it. There is a process, there is a labor involved. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, there is a time when this word of God, I can listen it to somebody who's preaching it. I can go to a Sunday service, 
Allow the priest to give me an understanding of the word. I can come to a Bible class like this. Somebody explains the word of God to me. And I feel that as long as I'm getting a ready-made meal ready for me, I'm very happy that I've got my ready-made meal ready. But you know, my brothers and sisters, God doesn't want you and me to just have a ready-made meal. Yes, we need to have a ready-made meal sometimes because we need to have a head start. But it is also important for us to cook our own food. Allow the Holy Spirit to teach us. Sit with the word of God. Ask the Holy Spirit. Help me, Holy Spirit. I want to take this passage. I want you to give me revelation. That brother with whom I went to that Bible class, he taught us a particular scripture. But I believe, Lord, that you can speak to me also. I want what he said to become real to me. I want you to explain it to me. I want you to give me something more out of it. Now, as you begin to desire that, my brothers and sisters, as you begin to go into that word yourself, God, who is faithful to his children, will surely open up the way for you. But if you're a person who's going to eat 365 days in McDonald's and in Kentucky Fried Chicken, a time will come you may not have money in your purse because you know you're spending a lot on ready-made food. You would rather prefer to eat some home cooked food. And you know, my brothers and sisters, home cooked food is always better than eating restaurant food. You can eat restaurant food for one day, two days, 15 days, one month, but eating all the year round, I'm sure nobody wants to do that. You want to eat some homemade food in the same way you and I need to sit with this word of God ourselves because the Lord said, I will plant my word in their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Brothers and sisters, let us not take the Holy, what the Holy Spirit spoke to somebody and, 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 and adopt that. But let the Holy Spirit speak to our heart. Let the Holy Spirit make the truths a reality for me. And when he makes it a reality to me, now I understand it. Now I shall follow that word. Now my relationship with the Lord will be right. And you know, my brothers and sisters, the Lord is saying, for those people who don't want to take the time out in order to and invest time studying the word, what does the Lord say? There are people like that who only want to take ready-made food. They'll go to one preacher, they'll go to another preacher, they'll go to another teacher. There will be about 10 teachers. They will go and listen to the word of God from so many places. Then what will happen? Because each one is giving their own interpretation, at the end of it, that person is going to be totally confused. Now look at what the Lord is saying in Luke chapter 17 verses 1 to 3. You know, my brothers and sisters, that's why it is so very important for us to study the word of God ourselves. Because when we get it directly from the Father, when we get it directly from the Holy Spirit, if we are hearing something which is contrary to the word of God, immediately the spirit of God within us will tell us, that's not the place to hear the word of God. That's the place I need to be cut off. And that's what we learned in the first class on discipline. If the preacher or the person or the pastor is going to preach something which is not the truth, eventually the Holy Spirit will, will, will convict the people who are really coming there and will say to him, don't listen to this man. Don't listen to that, to that false prophet because that person is going to take you away. And as a result, when that particular congregation begins to get diminished and that person begins to have no people to hear him, you know what is going to happen? The Lord is going to discipline that false prophet or discipline that teacher in order to go to the truth, study the truth and then share the truth because God is not going to allow anybody in order to share any any doctrine or false doctrine i want to take you to luke chapter 17 verses 1 to 3 and see what jesus says about somebody who is preaching a false doctrine somebody who's taking people away from their eternity somebody who deserves a very severe punishment luke chapter 17 verses 1 to 3 jesus said to his disciples Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to anyone by whom they come. It would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender. And if there is rep repentance, you must forgive. So what is Jesus saying here? He's saying 
if anyone is preaching a false doctrine, if anyone is taking people away from faith, the punishment that that person deserves is a millstone tied around his neck. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, somebody is in the sea, he's trying to survive in order for him to come up the water. If there's a millstone tied around your neck, do you think you can come up the, above the water? The person will always remain below the water. He will be totally drowned and he'll be dead. If this is what the punishment Jesus is saying for somebody who's preaching a false doctrine, somebody who just comes to the pulpit with, and just preaches anything out of his mind without preaching the truth, because that word that he's preaching is going to destroy so many souls. It's going to take somebody's faith. That's what Jesus says. If anyone who's going to do this, this sort of thing is going to make people to stumble is going to allow that person to lose their faith that's what jesus is saying he's saying the punishment that that person deserves is is actually death in the sea and he says therefore he says be on your guard be on your guard he says if another disciple sins you must rebuke the offender and if there is repentance you must forgive him. You know, my brothers and sisters, what is Jesus saying here? If you really have a relationship with the Lord, you really are studying the word of God. You're really living according to what the faith says. And you observe somebody in your church. You observe somebody who's not doing that. Your responsibility it is to go to that brother one to one. Don't gossip about that brother to somebody else. You know that fellow comes to the church. That fellow is doing like this. I heard about him. He's doing a lot of offenses at his workplace. Any information that you have received, in, before we open our mouths and tell anybody, if you really love that brother and you love him, his soul not to be lost, my brothers and sisters, it is important for us to go to that person. We are so concerned about ourselves. We love ourselves so much that we do not want to be rejected by somebody. And that is why the Lord is saying such a person, a millstone needs to be tied around their neck because they are more, they love themselves more than they love God. Imagine brothers and sisters, if there is somebody with whom you are fellowshipping, they are your good friends. But you know that they are not living according to the truth. They are not living according to the word of God. Even though they are your friends and you are a believer. Can you imagine if you don't tell them the truth? Where are they going to go when they pass out from this life? They have been your friends. God put you into that relationship with that person only for one reason. So that you would nicely use that relationship in order to tell the person the truth. You would tell that person that what they are doing is not right. But one to one. But what we do is we do not want to offend our friend. We don't want to lose that relationship. We don't want to offend them. So they will say, you please don't come to my place. We are so concerned about that relationship being lost that we fail to tell them the truth. And you know, my brothers and sisters, what did the, the word of God says in the book of Leviticus? It says, if you hate your brother and sister, only then you will never tell them the truth. But if you really love somebody, you love them to the point that you want their soul to be saved, you will open your mouth even at the cost of your relationship with them. But you will plant that seed of God's word, which may not sprout at that moment. But because you did what the Lord told you to do, that person's soul will be saved. You know, my brothers and sisters, please understand, we as the church have got a responsibility to fellow believers. If we are really following the word of God, if we are really our home, our house is built on the foundation of God's word. And therefore, brothers and sisters, if we are not showing any interest, on the contrary, we are letting somebody's clout, somebody's position, somebody's money, somebody's influence, influence our decision not to go and teach the word of God to them. Maybe somebody comes to us and gives us money. We are so enamored by, the, by that relationship that we don't tell them the truth. You know, my brothers and sisters, not only is the Lord saying a millstone needs to be tied around your neck, you need to be completely out of that fellowship because you are not bearing any fruit in the kingdom of God. And brothers and sisters, a believer, a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ is somebody who's not going to be concerned about his relationship with one another to the point that they are going to sacrifice the truth in order to preserve that relationship. But a person... Thank you, Brother Sandeep. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17. It says, you shall not hate in your, anyone in your heart. You shall reprove your neighbor. That's exactly the scripture. Because when we really love somebody, 
We will never ever hide the truth from them. We will immediately reprove them. We will tell them the truth. You are doing wrong. But many a times because we are afraid, we don't want to lose that relationship. We prefer to keep our mouth shut. We prefer to enjoy that fellowship. We prefer to enjoy all the benefits of that relationship. But we see that that particular soul is going to perish and we do nothing about it. Now let me take you to the other side of things. You know, my brothers and sisters, there were Pharisees at that time of Jesus. And these Pharisees, they thought that they were good God pleasers. But they were actually a big hypocrites. Because when they came to God, they wanted to show God how good they were. That everybody else was a sinner. That they were doing everything according to the law. But they were not doing anything in order to express the love that they had with God, with their brothers and sisters, especially when it came to sinners. I want to take you to Luke chapter 18 verses 10 to 12. Luke chapter 18 verses 10 to 12. It's talking about two people going to the temple. One was a Pharisee and one was a publican. Let us see what happens when the Pharisee went to the temple of God. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus God I thank you that I am not like other people thieves rogues adulterers or even like this tax collector I fast twice a week I give a tenth of all my income now this was the prayer of a Pharisee to the Lord can you imagine my brothers and sisters a Pharisee came to the Lord and he thought that he was doing a favor to the Lord by telling him, look at me, God, what a wonderful person I am. I am not a thief. I'm not a rogue. I'm not even like that tax collector right behind me. I give my tithes. I fast twice a week. I'm always praying. What do I need to hear the word of God? Why do I need to make a big fast? Look at me, Lord. What a great person I am. And what did the tax collector do? Verse number 13 onwards, the tax collector, the publican, he just put his head down and he said, God, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. And you know, my brothers and sisters, the word of God tells us at the end of this of this chapter that the man who actually put his head down and said to the Lord, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He went right with God. Not the public, not the Pharisee. The Pharisee was doing everything perfectly. He was praying. He was doing his obligation. He was praying every day. He was reading his Bible. He was in front of the blessed sacrament. He was praying his rosary. He was being, he was even giving alms to the old, old, uh, old, uh, old age home. He was doing everything perfectly right. But the Lord says, the man who humbled himself, lowered his face and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, is the person who, was, who went right with God. And you know, my brothers and sisters, today, how many of us could put ourselves in the place of the Pharisee and how many of us could put ourselves in the place of the, of the tax collector? It doesn't mean that we are all perfect people. Even though we are disciples, even though we are believers, we also at times got a little bit of Pharisee in us. We have got the tax collector in us, but we are work in progress. We know we need to eliminate, completely destroy the Pharisaical attitude with us because when we think we are righteous, we will never go out and try to discipline others. We will never go out and be a witness to others. We will never go out and tell somebody, listen, my brother, I love you so much. I observed this particular thing. I heard this particular thing. I want to help you. I want to share my testimony. I want to show you I was doing the same thing and I also have been set free. I want to show you the secrets from with, through the word of God. I want to help you, my brother, because your eternity is important for the Lord. Your eternity is important and also for you. How many of us would take a pharisaical attitude where we say, Lord, I'm so perfect. I'm doing the right thing. Let everybody go to hell. That tax collector, that neighbor of mine, everybody else, let them go to hell because they are rogues, they are thieves, they are adulterers. They are all these people around. Only I'm the right person. And you know, my brothers and sisters, the moment we begin to think that way, where we don't get out of our comfort zone and reach out to others, we are actually being Pharisees. And you know very well, brothers and sisters, Jesus could not save the Pharisees. 
Jesus couldn't save the Pharisees. They did everything right. They paid their taxes. They paid their tithes. They fasted. They prayed. They gave alms. They did everything right. But yet Jesus could not save them. Why? Because they thought they were so self-righteous. They thought that they were perfect people that they, God owed it to them. God had an obligation to them to bless them. And you know, my brothers and sisters, if we begin to have the same attitude, we will never have discipline in the church because even though we see things wrong in the church, even though we see, th see things wrong among our brothers and sisters, we will prefer to love ourselves to such an extent that we'll say, as long as I've done my obligation, as long as I read my Bible, as long as I did my rosary, as long as I heard the mass, all that matters is God is pleased with me. Other people, if they are not doing, it is their problem. No, my brothers and sisters, as the church, it is the responsibility of the church and its members to discipline one another, to be a witness to one another, to be an example to one another. And no, my brothers and sisters, please listen to this very carefully. A church that is not growing in love among its members, but only doing religion, doing rituals week after week, day after day, month after month, for years, withdrawing their fellowship from from those people who are doing wrong is going to be meaningless we saw that yesterday what is the use of taking somebody out from your church and just telling them leave the church if we have never ever shown them love if we are really not operating in love the person who has been told to leave will miss nothing because there was nothing of that ever in that church there was nothing of that in the church the love of god was never flowing in the church the truth was never being preached in that church so what is the use if you tell somebody to leave that church because the truth, he will, he will never miss anything. Only when the truth is being preached there, people are operating in love. People are sharing the love of Christ to one another. People are ready to be concerned for one another. People are interested for the, of the eternal destiny of one another. People are encouraging one another to share in their faith journey. That's the time when you take out somebody from that fellowship and keep him out as a discipline because he's, he's being poisoned into that fellowship. That's the time it's going to make a lot of meaning. That's the time withdrawing that fellowship is going to have real meaning there. Again, my brothers and sisters, if we withdraw our intercession from a brother or sister, you know, when we turn him over to Satan, what we saw that yesterday, what is the meaning of turning over somebody to Satan? It simply means because that person is a believer, he has accepted Christ. Now we are letting that person go from our fellowship so that now that person, you're not going to pray for them. You're not going to, you're going to withdraw intercessions from them so that that particular brother or sister will face the consequences of the sin that they are doing. Satan will come and kill, steal and destroy. Now, when that person begins to experience that from the enemy, that person is going to repent, come back to the church. He say, I have changed. I want to repent. I want to come back to this fellowship. And that's the time this brother is going to repent or this sister is going to repent and they will be reunited to the church. And that is why church discipline becomes so very important. So what are the obstacles, my brothers and sisters, to church discipline? And what are the serious effects? Because biblical discipline is not enforced today. Let me ask you a question. If we have seen as we began this class today that church discipline is something that is taboo, it's something that is not talked about, it is not even being enforced. And now that it is not being enforced, a lot of obstacles are there in the church because of church discipline not being done. What are the serious effects being done to the body of Christ because church discipline is not being enforced? You know, my brothers and sisters, because of the lack of, of church discipline. Remember, it's not taking a stick with somebody or, you know, starving somebody to death or putting him inside a cage. That not, that's not the discipline I'm talking about. I've already explained what discipline is about. Withdrawing the fellowship, keeping that person out of the fellowship, withdrawing the inter intercessions, not praying for that person, allowing that any person to face the consequences of their decision. That's all discipline. Now, if this particular discipline is not enforced, it is going to cause an erosion and it is going to bring a pollution in the body of Christ. You know, my brothers and sisters, one of the reasons why the church is weakened today is because church discipline is not there. It has caused a division in the body of Christ. You know, when a person is not disciplined, definitely there is going to be a division in the body of Christ. All a person who has been disciplined, say for example, you want to discipline somebody in, in the church today. What does the person has to do? 
he only has to walk out of your denomination he has to walk out of your church and he has to join another church and everything will be fine because that the other church will welcome that person and will fill the void because he's not having fellowship with you it happens for example if somebody belongs to the catholic church or somebody belongs to the pentecostal or somebody belongs to the evangelical church and in that church they discipline that person that person will simply leave and go and find because in the first place he never got anything that he was looking for in the very church he had and so brothers and sisters he will turn around and go to the other church because we are afraid that somebody will go and go and join some other church or some other denomination we are so afraid not to discipline a particular member we would rather allow that member to stay allow that member to put their poison inside allow that person to bring in all their all that uh, negativity among the other members allow gossip to take place allow the destruction of the church to take place and we allow that pollution to take place in the body of christ you know my brothers and sisters it is really sad today when you really begin to think that in the first century church right in the first century church when the when the early disciples were were, were were preaching the word of god this was not the case you know broken fellowship in the church with believers was had a very devastating you know it had a very devastating effect because you know discipline had to be done only on certain cases it was done and it was very very effective please understand in the early church people realized because the truth was being preached and they had really accepted the lord jesus christ they understood that now by receiving christ their eternal destiny was totally secure but after knowing that after having received the spirit having received the truth of god's word if they had to be disciplined they would be disciplined but it would have a very devastating effect on the believer because being thrown out of that fellowship being removed from that fellowship was something that would be done in the early church to protect the rest of the members please understand my brothers and sisters we saw yesterday when when we talked about saint paul there was a man in the church in corinth and what happened that man was was sleeping with the wife of his mother he was living in sexual misconduct what did what did saint paul say to the church i am handing this man over to satan so that this man's body will be destroyed his flesh will be destroyed so that his spirit his soul will be saved on the lord jesus christ and what happened finally this brother who was taken out of the fellowship this brother who was handed over to satan because he was behaving badly and he was being a bad influence in the church this brother eventually repented he was restored to the church and he was restored to the fellowship of believers you know my brothers and sisters if such discipline is imposed if, if you know we don't need to wait for the 11th hour to to make drastic decision until it goes into the press it goes into the internet people are all talking about it unbelievers are talking about it it is something that has to be monitored each member needs to be monitored we need to operate in love and unity in the body of christ today brothers and sisters to effectively ensure that church discipline is going to keep the church together is going to bring the church to make it grow and make people into a relationship with god you know my brothers and sisters limited although the results are very limited you know discipline is something that nobody is going to be happy about as i said to you the moment we talk about discipline people will say you want to discipline me because the human nature by by itself is always rebellious you you know if we operate in love with one another people are fine if you tell somebody with kind words even though they do wrong everybody is fine but the moment you begin to admonish somebody the moment you begin to pull up somebody the moment you begin to you know you know confront somebody with the truth of god's word and if that person is not living a righteous life is becoming a poison to the community being a poison in the body of christ this discipline is going to also you know uh, it's going to be, it's going to offend that person if he's not going to be open to it but brothers and sisters even though the results are limited even though the results may not seem to be as 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 it should be the word of god tells us that discipline has to be done the more a church has its as this unity among its members and an effective intercessory prayer life the more effective the discipline will be please understand my brothers and sisters in order for a church to grow in order for a church to really experience the presence of the spirit the presence of the word of god the presence of christ in that church 
it is important that that members of the church of the of that particular church should walk in unity should walk in love and most important they should have a very strong and effective intercessory life you know my brothers we saw yesterday in matthew chapter 18 you know in matthew chapter 18 right from 15 to 20 we saw the spiritual significance of this discipline i want to take you not to the whole chapter uh, not to the whole verse from 18 uh, from 15 to 20 but i want to take you from verses 17 18 and 19 verse number 19 let us read first let us go backward matthew chapter 18 verse number 19 again truly i tell you if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. If again truly I say to you, I tell you that Jesus is saying, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, I will, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. You know my brothers, this verse, verse number 18, that is Matthew 18 verse 19, has many applications but if you take it in context with what we are talking in our topic for the last two days this particular verse is talking about church discipline and we have seen that from verses 15 to 17 you know my brother says some think or some people think that church discipline is only symbolic and carries no real meaning it doesn't really carry any punch in it however jesus himself was making it crystal clear that in the spiritual realm, discipline that is directed by the Holy Spirit has real power. Let me say this again. You know, when we talk about discipline in the church, people think it is, you know, probably it is, you know, you're just admonishing somebody, you're just trying to calm somebody, you're just trying to get somebody on, on the right track. But that is not the case. If you read between verses 15 and 17, you will see that Jesus himself made it clear that in the spiritual realm, not in the physical realm, not what you see, in the spiritual realm, discipline that is directed by the Holy Spirit has real power. It has really a lot of significance. You know, let us see what the church discipline mentioned in Matthew chapter 18, verse 17 to 18 says. Let us read that. Let us go back to Matthew chapter 18, verses 17 and 18. If the member refuses to listen to them, Tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So, brothers and sisters, when you look at verses 17 and 18 that we just read, it says the process is very clear. The first process is you find somebody in the church who needs to be disciplined. It always has to be one to one. Never go and report about somebody who's doing wrong to the whole church directly. That's what we do today. We need to take the one to one uh, approach first. If by, by doing the one to one, it doesn't work, then you take the presence of another two or three witnesses because when you take two people who are offended another two three witnesses those two three witnesses can also be as witnesses to see between the two parties without any bias I mean they, they don't have any their own um, you know their own uh, benefits involved they are going to be neutral parties so they need to be witnesses now after taking two or three witnesses that person doesn't refuse he now you need to tell the whole church about it. So telling the church is step number three. But what happens today? We go to step number three, spoiling everybody's name. You know what that brother is doing. You know what that family is doing. Everybody in the church. Now, do you think that person ever, ever wants to change? That person will be humiliated. That person, in fact, instead of coming out in the open, is now going to be on the defensive. He's going to make a lot of enemies. Everybody is going to talk evil about that person. And therefore, brothers and sisters, verse number 17 and 18 says, If the member refuses to listen to them, now you go and tell the whole church. And if the offender refuses to even listen to the whole church, then only you will treat that brother or that sister as a Gentile or a tax collector. What is the meaning? You will treat them as a pagan. That's the last resort. 
that's the place where you will you will actually withdraw the fellowship so this discipline my brothers and sisters is a twofold discipline the first is withdrawing the fellowship with that particular person so that's the first step the second step is withdrawing our intercession on behalf of that person so the first step is that particular brother or that particular sister who has gone through that process of one to one with witnesses then by telling the church and he has not listened to the church that person now has to be taken out of your fellowship the second thing is you withdraw the intercession most of the time people are what are they doing they are praying for that brother to change now that he has gone through that process you withdraw your your intercession from that person don't pray for that brother don't pray for that sister so this second part of the discipline actually goes to such an extent that the church members are deliberately told not to pray or not to intercede that is the thing called binding the demonic forces which people are doing you know when people pray for one another they are actually acting of in a sense binding those demonic forces that are going to attack that person you know my brothers and sisters this particular part which is called as withdrawing of the intercession actually includes us losing them from our intercession and delivering them to satan for the destruction of their flesh this is the binding and losing being referred to in verse number 18 that we just read you know my brothers and sisters let us see what jesus himself says in john chapter 20 verse 23 because i want to show you when when jesus was as soon as jesus rose from the dead remember when jesus rose from the dead on on easter sunday he appeared to his 11 disciples uh, to his 10 disciples in a closed room on that particular day only 10 disciples were there because judas had died by them and thomas was not with them so there were only 10 of them now as soon as jesus enters into that room which was closed jesus speaks some words to them i want to show you how what we are learning about losing and binding of people especially when it comes to withdrawing the intercession jesus already spoke about it on the day of his resurrection john chapter 20 verse 23 if you forgive the sins of any they are forgiven them if you retain the sins of any they are retained if you forgive the sins of any they are forgiven them if you retain the sins of any they are retained please understand my brothers and sisters what is this that jesus is talking about the only person who can forgive sins is only god god has only the power but here he is saying if you forgive the sins of any they are forgiven if you retain the sins of any they are retained you know my brothers and sisters this is talking about binding and losing you and i as believers of the lord jesus christ we have the authority to bind demonic for powers forces operating against our brothers and sisters this is the thing what jesus was talking about remitting or forgiving their sins and we also have the authority to lose these power same powers in their lives and that is to retain the 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 the, the wrong doing that they are doing so this is for the sole purpose of causing that brother or that sister to repent and to be restored you know my brothers and sisters if those who are in rebellion listen to this very carefully those who are in rebellion especially in the church who who are right now who are not you know when they they, they refuse to hear one to one they refuse to hear with the witnesses of two or three people they refuse to hear to the church they refuse to hear the the leadership in the church or to refuse to listen to the members those who are in rebellion will not if they don't respond to these steps that have been taken jesus has laid down those rules in matthew chapter 18 verses 15 to 17 and we the church should discipline them by not fellowshipping with them by any longer but on the contrary we should stop we should stop interceding for them there's no longer binding taking place so the consequences of their sins they would normally come to the law of sowing and reaping so as they sow the sin they will reap the consequences of all that they are sowing but as long as brothers and sisters are praying for them the devil will not attack them they will continue to do all those wrong things and you know my brothers and sisters that person will never ever repent and come back to the lord so we are actually to retain their sins unto them as we saw in john chapter 20 verse 23 which is the same thing 
as delivering them over to Satan. That's what St. Paul wrote. Yesterday we saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 5. You know my brothers, please listen to this very carefully. This particular loosing and, 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 and you know a binding simply means that we lose Satan to have access to these brothers and sisters who are in rebellion as their sins deserve them with the hope that they will realize how deadly their sins are and they will repent before Satan destroys them. That is the reason why we have to not, we have to sometimes withdraw intercession. Many a times I hear some parents come to me. You know, some parents come for counseling. They say, my son is not listening to me. My daughter is not listening to me. We have been praying for so long, but there is no this thing. Because you are praying, they are not even facing the consequences of all the mess that they are doing in their life. Your prayers is, is actually stopping Satan from, from causing problems in their life. And as a result, they are continuing to do all the wrong. They continue doing all the wrong. Your prayers are protecting them from Satan. But you know, my brothers and sisters, listen to this very carefully. Proper intercession can actually keep Satan at bay. Though people are living in great sin, how many times Parents are praying for their children. The children are in absolute rebellion. They are doing their own things. Now parents will say, I am praying to the Lord that the child of mine will come back. Yes, you continue to pray. But there is a time because your prayers are only protecting them from the devil's attacks. Your prayers are actually acting as a hindrance for the devil to attack them. There is a time because you love your child, you want to save your child's soul. You need to withdraw that inter intercession. You need your child to face the consequences because you love your child to the point your child's soul has to be saved. And this is the same formula that Jesus is talking about in the body of Christ. You know, my brothers and sisters, this is a good, this particular thing is good if they use this freedom to repent and come back to the Lord. But if they take this freedom to commit more sin, then comes a time when this form of intercession ceases to be beneficial to that brother, to that sister, or even to your child. In that case, intercession against Satan attacks should be withdrawn and we should actually retain those people's sins unto them so that they can no longer get going by experiencing the, the freedom. They are not going to experience that protection. They are going to face the consequences of their sins. That's what exactly what the book of Romans says. The wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. So if anybody is committing sin, you are only giving an access to the devil. But because people are praying for you, the devil cannot attack you because your prayers are acting like a barrier and yet that person is committing sin. So brothers and sisters, when the, when the intercession is withdrawn, as they start reaping what they have sown, it will hopefully cause them to turn back to the goodness of the Lord and now they can come back and join into the fellowship. You know, my brothers and sisters, this is a very severe thing to do. Very severe thing. I don't think if I tell any parent to withdraw and don't pray for your children, you will say, brother, what are you talking about? I love my child. I want them to be protected from the devil. But if you are only interested to let them live in sin and be such a poor witness of the Christ to the world, you have to show tough love. T-O-U-G-H. Tough L-O-V. Love. Because this is a very severe thing to do. It has to be done. And it should be not taken lightly, my brothers and sisters. That's why. That's why Jesus instructed us to employ these three steps, which I talked about in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 17. This should be done as a church body, thus preventing one person from trying to use binding and losing as a form of vengeance also. You know, there are so many times people in the church, they use this particular thing in order to get even at somebody else. That happens so many times in the church. Now listen to this very carefully. This is another aspect that many people have never thought about. You know, you know, Matthew chapter 18 verse 19, it states that when two believers who are employing this principle of binding and losing, they can do it. For example, if two agree about anything they, they pray for on earth, it shall be done by the Father in heaven. So brothers and sisters, according to Matthew chapter 18 verse 20, two believers gathered in Jesus' name constitute a, me, a, a gathering of the church. Remember, two or three gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. So when two or three gather, it's already the church. And a special anointing of the Lord is present when believers get together. Now listen to this. There are also other ways of applying the scripture. Imagine one of the tragic applications of the scripture is when two or three believers 
are gathered together and they fall into gossip and criticism of a particular member of the church. Listen to this, a very dangerous situation. When two or three believers gather together, it's already the church because Christ is present. There is an anointing of the Lord which is present there. Now, instead of those two people using that in order to bind the powers of Satan or, you know, to bring that person to the Lord, they fall into the, uh, into the sin of gossip and criticism. The same spiritual law will now start working in the opposite manner. And it will work in the reverse order in which, which God intended. You know what will happen, my brothers and sisters? We can actually bind up the positive results of sowing and reaping in godly people's life and lose the attack of Satan against them by the words that we speak. It's so very important. Proverbs chapter uh, 18 verse 21, it says, Life and death is in the power of the tongue. If you and I are sitting together as church and we are gossiping about, about a fellow believer, we are talking about what that fellow is doing, what his wife is doing, what they are doing at workplace. And instead of trying to help that brother by talking to him one to one or going together as, as witnesses after going to that one to one, which has failed, then only we can bring that brother to the Lord. But instead of that, we are sitting together as witnesses. That brother is far away. He doesn't know what is happening. But we have gathered together as a church, even two or three people. And now we fail to lift up that brother or sister in intercession. We in fact are turning that brother or sister over to, over to Satan through our neglect and through our criticism and through our gossiping. You know, my brother says, we must understand. Please listen to this very carefully. We must understand that our actions we can have eternal consequences for others, especially in the body of Christ, when we fail to discipline and lead them to renounce, you know, by, by renounce their sin and come back to the Lord. In fact, many a times, because we fail to discipline the people, they renounce their faith and they are exposed to the wolves of this godless world. So many people today, because they have not been disciplined, they think that this church is, is just like that. This is like chalta hai. Everything goes, everything comes. They come there, they bring in all their poison. And finally, when it is too late, we tell that person, we drive him out. That person goes and gets into fellowship with the wolves in the, in the world. They get into fellowship with the godless in the world. You know, these verses which we have just read in Matthew chapter 18 verses 15 to 19, they reveal to us that even heaven and earth are affected by our binding and losing. When we intercede for people, when we talk to them one to one, when we discipline them, when we give them the love of God, when we share the good news of Jesus, we show concern for one another, one another. we really want them to be saved by giving them the truth. Now only, the presence of God, the spirit of God will lead that church in order to bring unity, in order to bring love. And when that church is really growing, people on the outside will come there because they will really experience the love. They will experience the presence of God. They will truly experience a renewed life by coming to that church. And you know, my brothers and sisters, today, as we studied in these last three days about discipline in the church, we need to understand don't like, let us not look at somebody in authority or let us lo not look at all the people in leadership in order to discipline. Each one of us who are members of the body of Christ, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to be the people that we need to be to our other fellow believers. And when we see something wrong, let us not, you know, wait for somebody else to do the correction. Let us not say it is none of my business because the word of God tells us if we are the church, only the church can correct one another. If we see that, it is important for us to go out, share the truth, share the good news, one to one. If we find that we have failed one to one, take another two, three witnesses so that they also will be there to, to as, as witnesses to what that brother or the sister is saying. And finally, if he doesn't listen to that, then tell it to the whole church. So with the hope that that brother or that sister will change. And only after all these three methods have been exhausted, then only you take that brother or sister out of the fellowship. You stop interceding for them, hoping that when you know they will face the consequences of their decision, repent and come back to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, if we can follow this, this principle of discipline, I can tell you, we can make a very big impact in the body of Christ. We can make a tremendous impact in our own generation. We can make a tremendous impact in our families, in our communities. But 
we need to really be people whom the Lord really will depend on, who will be trustworthy to really love the people around us, not loving ourselves, but loving the people so that they can also be saved. They also can be witnesses to the ends of the earth. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you for giving us, taking on this beautiful three journey of discipline, Lord. Lord, we are each one of us who are believers. We don't need to look at others to, to bell the cat, as we say. We don't need to look at others to correct others. We need to start that correction in our own homes, in our own families, by our own example, by our own living. What good is it for a person or a father who's drinking to tell his children not to drink when he is being a poor example? In the same way, Lord, what good is it for us to go and point fingers to others when we ourselves have got to put our own home and our own lives in order? Today, Lord, help us through the discipline that we have by our relationship with the Holy Spirit and the Word to be the witnesses that you want us to be so that through our lives we can go out, share the good news. We can look for people with opportunities to share the good news. Bring them in discipline to the Lord and help them also to be saved and experience eternal life. For this great privilege, for this great understanding, for this great opportunity, we thank you and we praise you, Father, in the glorious and mighty name of Jesus. Amen.